Well, thanks for coming. You've learned justice, though it comes too late. You might know where that, that line's from. That's what the chorus says to Creon in Sophocles' Antigone. Remember the dreadful consequences of his foolishness, his, his pride, his refusal to listen to others. Uh, at this point, I'm full-time administration. Uh, I don't have a classroom of my own um, at this point. Uh, but I love every, every opportunity I get uh, to step into classrooms and whatever teachers are out uh, to go fill in for them. It's always fun to get back in the classroom. Again, so I had this opportunity in our seventh grade Omnibus One class here a couple years ago because uh, one of our teachers had gone on a study abroad program to the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, Cancun, I think it was. Uh, I hope it was fruitful for him. <laughs> so I was left there with Sophocles, and we did the whole trilogy, Theban trilogy. Uh, and we were reading Antigone. It's my first time to read Antigone. But as I was reading this, I, I really saw the heart of classical education. Uh, so as I'm there with these students, these seventh grade students, I, you know, of course, jumped onto my proverbial soapbox uh, and reading this line, there, you have learned justice though it comes too late. I said to the students, learn justice. Learn justice. There is a time when it will be too late. Crean had failed to listen to his counselors. So I asked the students, I said, who are your counselors? All right, their responses were parents, yes, yeah. Teachers, yeah, yeah, that's true. You, hopefully, hopefully so. I said, yes, yes, this is, this is great, yes, they, these are your counselors, these, these people. But, but not only these people, but Sophocles, is your counselor, and Homer, and Aristotle, and Augustine, and Thomas, and Milton, and Dante, and Tolkien, and Lewis. These are your counselors. That's, that's why you're here, right? So you can sit in the presence of your counselors. And their faces fell. Another's head fell despairingly on his omnibus book. Of course, there were a few students who received this ex exhortation with delight, but most, upon hearing that Sophocles was a counselor, didn't take it um, quite as seriously as I'd hoped. Because the reality is that we are dealing with little creons. They are refusing to engage their counselors, as we all have, we put these books before them, and like leading a horse to water, we plead with them to drink, but it is, their, it is theirs to drink. A couple years ago at this conference, David Goodwin uh, was talking about uh, the barbell, and as educators, it was barbell, we're trying to keep in balance two things with our students. One is the Imago Dei, and one is their sinful nature. All right, we have these two things that are, that are trying to hold in balance, that they have this propensity to be little creons on one side, but the other side is a redeemed nature in Christ. We're seeking to call out their true selves, the new man in Jesus, while also calling out their false and foolish selves. And this is what effective teachers do. So why it's important to be an effective teacher. Because in these moments, during these classes that we have, you stand before these students. You stand with these students. You sit with these students, whatever this format is that you may be in. And you stand in the gap between Creon and Antigone, between the Cyclops and Odysseus, between Grindel and Beowulf, between Goliath and David, and most importantly, between the powers and principalities of darkness and the Lord Jesus Christ. I think most of us recognize that the change that we, we hope to see in our students, for them to make this, 
uh, movement to embrace what their counselors are saying, to heed, their, to heed their advice, to listen to them, to seek justice, is something that we must do ourselves first. Are we listening to our counselors? Are we seeking justice ourselves? Oddly enough, this is what led me to Stephen Covey's wildly popular Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I picked this book up a couple years ago. I was very skeptical uh, of the value that would come from such a book, uh, but I figured it was worth giving it a shot. And what I realized is that Stephen Covey is a heretic. And yes, I don't mean that he was a Christian heretic, because he actually was. He's a Mormon. But more so, he's a secular heretic. Instead of worshiping at the cultural idols of pragmatism and relativism, he talked as a heretic to these things. He wrote about eternal principles principles that cannot be changed, that are implanted in the very fabric of the universe. This is secular heresy. And yet, his book is sold like wildfire. 25 million copies sold as of 2004. Who knows how many by this point. Instead of a quick fix book, this book challenged me to see my own propensity to be Creon. It's my own propensity to neglect counselors in my life, and that I need to change. So I'll briefly summarize Covey's seven habits for those who haven't read it. The first three habits fall into a grouping of private victory. These are the things that are in our own life that we have to look at. So before we go and, and look at others, we have to consider about ourself. And that is, number one, be proactive. Number two, begin with the end in mind. Number three, put first things first. I'm sure a quick Google search could come up with these two if you need a reminder. The next three are the public victory. So number four, the fourth habit is think win-win. It's actually, it's actually develops it as win-win or no deal. This is one of my favorite principles, actually. It becomes very helpful in administration. Win, win, or no deal. Number five is seek first to understand, then to be understood. Number six is synergize. And the last is the process of reviewing and renewing he calls sharpen the saw. So I want to use this seven habits as a launching pad to, to jump into this discussion today. Uh, and what we're going to be talking about, of course, is effectiveness. And when we're talking about effectiveness, I'm, I mean effectiveness and productivity. I'm going to use those interchangeably. Uh, I think they mean essentially the same thing. Uh, Matt Perman wrote a book called What's Best Next. Anybody read that book? Fantastic book. Um, he, was, uh, is, uh, he worked at Desiring God Ministries for a while. Uh, so it's written from a very a Christian and Reformed perspective, uh, but is about uh, productivity and effectiveness. I highly recommend it. In the preface to his book, he's, he gives 12 myths about productivity. And then he responds to the myth. I want to look at two of those myths real quick. The first myth that he brings up, so this is a myth. The myth is that productivity is about getting more done faster. And when I say myth, I mean that in the non-classical sense. I mean it in the sense of something that's not true. So I apologize to everyone that's like, just because it's a myth doesn't mean it's not true. His answer to this, he says, is when most people think of productivity, they, they actually think of efficiency, getting more things done faster. While efficiency is important, it is secondary. More important than efficiency is effectiveness, getting the right things done. 
Peter Drucker says, nothing is less productive than to make more efficient what should not be done at all. Nothing is less productive than to make more efficient what should not be done at all. So when we're talking about effectiveness and productivity, we're not talking about the same thing as efficiency. Though they can be related. The other myth that he brings up is that productivity is best defined by tangible outcomes. All right, so that's not necessarily true. Productivity defined by tangible outcomes. The answer he gives is more and more productivity is about intangibles. Relationships developed, connections made, and things learned. We need to incorporate intangibles into our definition of productivity. So when I look at my own work day, there are days when I never touch my to-do list. Right, which at this point has moved mostly from being a handwritten list to some kind of app or a program on my computer that has a little you know, badge icon that starts coming up with the number of things that I've missed for the day as it gets up to 55, you know, 56, 65, 66, whatever. You know, these, these things keep on adding up, right? And it's easy to look at this, these, these badges that are coming up and reminding me of all the things I haven't done and think I haven't been productive, but that's not, that's not the case. That's not what productivity necessarily means. I think about my wife at home with, with four children. Uh, so, I mean, they're seven years old as the oldest and then march on down. Right, so a lot of young ones there at home. Uh, her day can hardly be managed in, in the tangible outcomes. Right, her to-do list um, doesn't really look like a to-do list. It is more of the time spent, the things that are intangible. Right, that's productive for, uh, for her. For teachers, there's so much of what you do that cannot be captured on a checklist. By the time you spend investing in your lesson plans, the conversations you have with parents in the hall, discoursing at the lunch table with your peers, encouraging students whose pet frog has died, cleaning vomit up in the kindergarten room. I thought that was the worst you could get. I found out recently that's not the worst it can be. <laughs> Going to conferences with great friends like this. Right, all of these are productive tasks. What I don't want you to think is that I'm saying you need more checklists. You don't need more to-do lists. What it's about is what's best. If you're going to write something down, this is a good one to write down. What's best right now, right where you are, even today? This is the heart of what uh, of Perman's book, why it's what's best next. It's what's, what's right in front of you today. Using Matt Perman's definition, he calls gospel-driven productivity. Gospel-driven productivity. The essence of gospel-driven productivity is we are to use all that we have in all areas of life for the good of others to the glory of God. We are to use all that we have in all areas of life for the good of others to the glory of God. Similarly, Tim Challies in his book, Do More Better, defines productivity as effectively stewarding your gifts, talents, time, energy, and enthusiasm for the good of others and the glory of God. Tim Challies' book is also a great uh, little resource. It's much shorter than uh, Matthew Perman's book. Um, I would prefer Matthew Perman's book. I think it's a, it's a better holistic book, but if you want a short uh, jump in, uh, Challies has a good uh, short read. Jonathan Edwards says, There is another that has made you and, and preserves you and provides for you and on whom you are dependent. And he has made you for himself and for the good of your fellow creatures, not only for yourself. 
has made you for himself. Did I say that? Did I misquote that? He has made you for himself and for the good of your fellow creatures, not only for yourself. John Piper and Don't Waste Your Life. Remember I Don't Waste Your Life? It's a great condensed version of Desiring God and about half the books he's written. It's always good. He says, aimless, unproductive Christians contradict the creative, purposeful, powerful, merciful God we love. Aimless, unproductive Christians contradict the creative, pur purposeful, powerful, merciful God we love. Keep in mind, we're talking about being productive is not completing checklists or to-do lists. It is seeing what's right in front of you. For the remainder of the time, I'm going to mix some of Doug Wilson and Stephen Covey together. Um, another great resource, I think probably everybody here has read or most of you have read, is the John uh, Milton Gregory, Seven Laws of Teaching. Um, who's read that, Seven Laws? It's pretty well required reading for most um, teachers. Um, so that's also a great resource. I'm not going to interact with that, but it'd be a great thing to bring in as well. For you, you guys who've read the Seven Laws, do you have the one with Doug Wilson who wrote the forward to it? In that, in that forward, he has some great, he has his own seven laws um, that, he, that he makes uh, at the beginning. And I'm going to take from Wilson, I'm going to grab a couple of those things that Wilson says in the forward to the seven laws of teaching. So we have all kinds of numbers going around here. I apologize for, I'm sure it gets confusing. I'm sure Plato could find some kind of mathematical equation and meaning that it has. The first one I want to look at here is from Wilson. So number one for us is point number five in Wilson's forward. He says, a highly effective teacher will understand the doctrine of vocation. A highly effective teacher will understand the doctrine of vocation. Wilson says, for the reformers, every aspect of life was under the lordship of Christ which meant that every vocation is full-time Christian work. There is no other kind. Teaching math or grammar is full-time Christian work. Famously, Martin Luther says, a cobbler, a smith, a farmer, each has the work and office of his trade, and yet they are all alike consecrated priests and bishops, and every one by means of his own work or office must benefit and serve every other. I'm not really into the uh, mystical view of calling or vocation in which uh, we might try and search for this nebulous idea out there of what I might be called to uh, one day. I'm, I'm not really into voices or feelings of such things. Um, I am more into the, the uh, incarnational basic uh, place that we find ourselves in in this world I think this comes from when I, when I look at myself as, as a married man, um, I know from that truth that I'm called to be a husband right, because I'm married. And also because I have four children at home, I know I'm called to be a father. I don't need to hear from God on that one. I'm not waiting for a voice to speak out of the clouds. It's quite evident. So how do I know that I'm called to be involved in classical education? Well, because classical school at Wichita allows me to come to work every day and even gives me a paycheck to do so. Each one of you is called to the task you're in. And how do you know? Because you're there. Because you're here right now. 
You know for this moment you are called to this. We don't know what you're going to be called to tomorrow or, or the or next year, right? What James says, don't you know, worry about all these things that are happening in the future. But as of today, this is your calling. I love how Bruce reminds us um, as we're in the hall and we see Johnny hit Billy and uh, or Billy hit Johnny, whatever it is. You know, that God has ordained for us to be there in that moment. That before time began, God had ordained us by His own free will and according to His sovereign purpose that you do what you are doing, right? Each of these things are sovereignly ordained by God. We are called to this. In the same way, God has called your students to be students. How do we know? Because they're in your classroom. Right? That is their calling at that moment in their life. And He will call them into professions, into roles in the church, family, and community. Wherever they may go, they are called to do so. It is our calling to equip them for whatever that might be. So for highly effective teachers, we must understand this view of vocation. You are a called person. You're called to what you're doing by God. Number two, in Wilson's Ford, this is the first point he makes. A highly effective teacher will love God, love life, love the students, and love the subject he teaches. Love God, life, students, subject. He says, Jesus taught us that when the process of education is complete, the student will have become like his master. His ineffective teaching occurs when no student wants that unfortunate result to happen to him. The student becomes like the teacher. You know that you have been ineffective when the student regrets that happening. He continues, this is what true teaching is. This is good stuff right here. This is what true teaching is. Love the subject and the presence of students whom you also love and do it because you love how God is so kind to us. Whenever we hire at, at CSW, the main rubric for hiring, love Jesus, love students, love your subject. And we talk about it quite a bit. Love Jesus, love students, love your subject. If any of those are missing, don't apply. I think this is what makes great schools is when you have faculties that are marked by this right you have faculty that is marked by their love for God that they, they love to be there with the students um, but not only that because there's a, there's a lot of progressive schools that do a fairly good job of that Christian pro progressive schools but not only to love to, to be a good Christian uh, Christ follower and to and to love to be with kids but it is important that we love the material that we are teaching. All right, I think this is what sets us apart in, in such a distinct way from progressive models of Christian education. It is in my experience, I taught at a progressive uh, Christian school for four years before I went into classical education. The teachers don't actually love the material. It's something you get through. It's something that's necessary uh, for the students to, to get this part in their life. 
And I always knew being there, there was something missing. There was something missing in the conversations that were happening in the hallways among the teachers. It's like, what, you know, where are the conversations about these amazing things that are, that are taking place in the classroom, these amazing works that are, uh, are being discussed? They weren't reading a whole lot of primary text at the time, so there wasn't maybe as much engagement to happen. And I knew whenever I came to CSW that there was something so different because the faculty... Not only do they love God and love students, the conversation overflows out of the classroom. Right? And then the teachers at the lunch table are having the conversation. The great conversation continues to happen right? about all these ideas. Whenever we sit down at lunch at CSW, um, it is always theology, philosophy. These kind of things are, ta are taking place. It's, it's, it's rarely about, oh, can you believe what so-and-so did? Can you believe what so-and-so said? And those are the conversations that drove me mad um, where, where I was before. All the conversations among faculty seemed to just be so trivial. But we must be in love with the great things, the great conversation as well. Number three, also number three from Wilson, a highly effective teacher will understand the profound profound differences between methods for teaching and principles of teaching. What is the time this ends? 920, good thing. Methods change, principles never change. Once the new method becomes the established way, he says, People start to take it for granted and then forget the principles. Effective teachers never forget the principles. I'm going to skip over this section from, from Covey. Covey has some great things about, um, about principles. I'm going to skip over that. I'm going, to, I'm going to hit this, this last point that he says. Though. One of the things that Covey, Covey says about, about principles, he says, As we continue to grow and mature, we become increasingly aware that all of nature is interdependent, that there is an ecological system that governs nature, including society. All right, this, this is coming from this, this, this person who is speaking to business leaders about the principles of running their organizations, but this is the same thing that we preach in our liberal, liberal arts schools, right? Our classical schools, particularly as Christian liberal arts educators, we hear this and we think, "Well, yeah, duh, of course, everything's interrelated." All right? There is one God who created the entire universe, right? The unified existence of all things. So there are principles that govern reality. As teachers, we must stick to the principles of teaching, right? Not just the latest trends or methods of teaching. I think this is what's so brilliant about John Milton Gregory's Seven Laws. You read it and you're like, yeah, of course this is true. Is anything, can anything be more obvious? Teacher needs to know the information. Yeah, of course. But, yeah, we do need to be reminded of those things sometimes, especially when you realize how far away we've gotten from, from that in modern pedagogical methods. All right, back to where we were before. So number four of, our, of the five points we'll end up making here. Covey's habit number two, begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. What is the end? What is the telos? What is the final cause? A while back we were listening to a missionary at church. I think most of us experience this when they come back from wherever they may be overseas. And they are sharing about their experiences there and the things that they've learned and the things that they're doing. And 
it occurred to me listening to this missionary, this, this is our goal. This, this, this is what our goal is. This is the end of what we are doing. We are creating missionaries. And I don't mean this in a simplistic sense, um, just of that we're, make, we're creating students who will go overseas. I don't even mean this in the sense that they'll, per, that they'll pursue careers for the, just for the sake of sharing the gospel in those places, or strictly as a platform for that, which, of course, these are good things. But more than that, our goal is that in every endeavor, in every action, every thought, that they are seeking to glorify Christ and to make Him known in every act, in the entirety of their being, that their eudaimonia, is that a, is that a term that you guys are familiar with? Eudaimonia, this is a classical um, term for the good life. What, it, what is the good life? What's the vision uh, for the happiest life? So this is the question the philosophers are always seeking to answer. What makes life What's the happiness of life? What is the eudaimonia? Our goal is that our students, that their eudaimonia, that their vision of the happy life is to know Christ and to make Him known. And after reading all these books and studying all this grammar and taking in all this math, that what makes them happiest is Christ and making Christ known. Not as an attachment, but all throughout, right? That the entirety of everything they're learning is bringing them closer and closer to that idea. That the just and martyrs of the world might be confounded. Eusebius says in his uh, church history, May, may what Justin Martyr says of the Christians there in his time, this is as he is uh, talking about his conversion to Christ, may this also be said of our students. So Justin Martyr says of these Christians, he says, While reveling in Plato's teaching, I myself heard the Christians abused. But when I saw that they were not afraid of death or anything dreadful, it occurred to me, that they could not possibly be living in wickedness as libertines. For how could a hedonist or a voluptuary who enjoyed devouring human flesh greet the death that would deprive him of the objects of his lusts? Would he not instead try to prolong his present life by all means and elude the authorities rather than surrender himself to certain death? Justin Martyr is blown away, right? Everybody was in the talk yesterday talking about Augustine in the same way as he... As he loses his friend. Right, he realizes that he's, lo he's, he's, he's enchanted by this Manichae uh, heresy, which is essentially a, a, a distorted form of Platonism, uh, trying to mix with Christianity. He realizes that this whole Manichae heresy is nothing compared to the, to the realness of, of the person that he's been connected with. His friend, in, the same, in a similar fashion, Justin Martyr is looking at these students and saying, my whole vision of life is disturbed now because of seeing these people whose vision of the happy life is Christ and that even life itself can be deprived and their happiness is not. That is our goal. That is the end in mind. Continuing this line of thinking at the beginning of the end of mind, Covey says, Efficient management without effective leadership is, as one individual has phrased it, like straightening deck chairs in the Titanic. No management success can compensate for failure in leadership. You may be asking, what does this have to do with me? You, you're, you're an administrator. This is your job to be the leader in the school. You're the one who's supposed to manage all these things. You take care of all the leadership stuff, and we'll take care of the, the teaching in the classroom. This does apply to you as teachers. You are not simply managing students. You are leading them. 
You must have a vision of where you are going. This is, this is the great, I don't know if everybody here is K through 12 or not, but this is the great thing about K through 12 education, is that a kindergartner can walk into a class of 12th graders and they can see, okay, this is where we're going. All right, so what I'm doing here in kindergarten is fitting into something. It's, it's a piece of where this whole project's going. And of course, inversely, the 12th grade teacher can go into kindergarten and say, okay, here's how they're starting. Right, and you have conversations to bring this whole thing in line. Right? That there's, there's a goal, there's an, there's an end, there's a telos that we're, that we're moving toward. And as schools, we have to be unified in this approach. And it's easier said than done. Trust me, I, I know for sure. Somebody once said, no student is greater than his master. And I know that you and we all want your students to surpass you. I think all of us want our students to go beyond where we are. But in the moment when they are sitting in your classroom, you are greater than them. Which means you set the ceiling of how much they will learn, how passionate they are about the subject, and how all they are, and all they are. And yes, of course, not all students are going to be so super excited about everything, and you cannot force them to drink from the water to which they are led, but you certainly can lead them to inferior watering holes. You can't force them to drink the water once you lead them there. But you can lead them to inferior watering holes. And that's the teacher's fault. On one hand, you have the ability to turn Moby Dick's ocean into a puddle. Tragic. Right? This is modern education. That's, that's modern education in, in a nutshell. If you want to know the difference between classical education and modern education, turn Moby Dick's ocean into to a puddle. But on the other hand, you can turn Walden Pond into an ocean. Right, what's, what's the vision you are leading them to? Are you, setting a, are you creating a ceiling that's so low that they're going to hit up against it and they're going to be done? Or are you putting the ceiling so high that they have all this room to explore, to be excited about, to have joy in? Number five, this is Covey's, Covey's habit. Number three, but first things first. But first things first. While leadership decides what first things are, it is management that puts them first, day by day, moment by moment. Management is discipline carrying it out. I love this. Leadership decides what first things are. So when you're leading, you're, you're, you're setting what is the telos, what is the end goal. You're casting a vision. But it's management that puts it into action. Puts them first, day by day, moment by moment. Management is discipline carrying it out. Tim Challey says, as many have pointed out, motivation gets you started, but habit keeps you going. So you need to use those high times of motivation, high motivation to build habits and to embed those habits in a system. That way, when motivation wanes, the system will keep you going. So hopefully the conversations that you guys have been having yesterday, this morning, that you're walking over to this session, hopefully it's reignited a spark in you, right? It's, it's a fresh 
motivation. Take advantage of this time. Take advantage of the, of the time when you feel refreshed and you feel excited again about these things. And create a plan. A plan to build habits. Create a liturgy that will carry you day to day, putting first things first, because the excitement will wane. Excitement will wane. And if this is true of us as teachers, how much more is it true of students? There is a cyclical nature to this. As we set the routines of our lives according to um, what is most important, these routines or liturgies remind us, better yet, they reform us to live out what is most important. And some of you may be familiar, when, when I'm using this term liturgy, this is becoming a, a fairly popular term um, in the classical education world, um, for creating these habits, these, these processes, um, that day to day are in place, that even when we don't feel like doing something, are structurally reminding us and our students of what's important. Right? This, this is what happens, I don't know who does um, like Pledge of Allegiance, other schools, um, that's, but it's a perfect example of what liturgy is. Right? It's, it's amazing how our modern education system says, oh, no, you don't want to keep on repeating things over and over again because then the students lose, you know, they don't take it seriously anymore. But no, no that's, not, that's not true. Right? Pledge of Allegiance is a pretty good example of that. Right? There's something about doing it over and over and over again. And then whenever you get, you know, you go to some event, you know, and there's thousands of people there and they're all doing it together where it's like, wow, this is, this is an amazing feeling. Um, it, kind of, it kind of overtakes you for a moment. You're like, why do I even feel this way? I don't, I'm not even sure why I feel this, but I, there's something in me that feels this way, right? It's from doing this over and over again. You know, what, are, what are we doing in that same vein? I'm not, I'm not here to advocate for saying the Pledge of Allegiance. What I'm, what I'm advocating is what are we doing in that same vein, what are those same liturgies that are, are in place day after day after day that are ingraining in our students what is true and what is valuable? James K. Smith is speaking of the power of practice in his book Imagining the Kingdom. says, The formative power of practices, communal embodied rhythms, rituals and routines over time, quietly and unconsciously, prime and shape our desires and most fundamental longings. Later he says, ritual is the way we learn to believe with our bodies. If you haven't read, um, he has a condensed version of these, these books, You Are What You Love, uh, James K. Smith. Highly recommend it to think through these ideas. Uh, was how do liturgies affect us and maybe give you some ideas. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a book that's written for classical educators in particular, um, so you're going to have to think through some ideas of what that looks like in your classroom, but I think it'll help you, help, it helped me tremendously to understand the power that these things have in our lives. Uh, that most of us especially in, in uh, America and probably in our educational world, get stuck in our heads, right? We, get, we buy this idea, if I can get it in my head, that it's going to change who I am. But the reality is we actually need to get it into our heart. Um, which, of course, if you've read C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man, is exactly what his argument is. Um, very in line with the classical understanding of, of people so while we don't have time to get into all the arguments of what, what uh, Smith gets at here, the heart of what he's saying is that the way to get belief, knowledge, truth from our heads down into our chest is through routine and ritual, through day by day, class by class, 
hour by hour, subject by subject, 170 to 180 days per year routines. He calls this habitus. So Smith calls it habitus. Which reminds us that in Covey's Seven Habits, we may not be as far from the kingdom as we think. So in conclusion, why do we want to be a highly effective teacher, putting these things into practice? Because in the end, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And in so doing, everyone will learn justice. Grindel and the Cyclops and Goliath and the principalities and powers of darkness and Creon. But at that point, it will be too late. May we do everything in our power to stand in the gap for our students. Thank you for your time, guys.